Welcome to Dementia-Friendly Prince George's County, Maryland, Northern Sector's webinar series for caregivers. Today's topic is See Me at the Smithsonian. This video is sponsored by Prince George's County Government and the Department of Family Services. Hello everyone. My name is Amy Casti and I'm the lead educator for See Me at the Smithsonian and my colleague Robin can introduce themselves. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having us. Uh, my name is Robin Marquis and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for CME at the Smithsonian. So we'd like to talk with you for a few moments about what CME is and what our goals are with that program. Um, the program is designed for folks who are living with dementia and for their care partners together to visit the museum. Um, in the past, we've done those programs in gallery, um, but since COVID has been happening, we're doing that virtually, so we would be in a Zoom setting and having our conversations with everyone in the comfort of their own homes. But a team of our museum educators, whether those are uh, paid staff or trained docents or myself or Robin, we get together with our folks who come to visit us and we have a just a basic conversation of folks sitting around talking about art. It's not anything that requires any previous knowledge of art and the Goals of the program are, um, as you can see on the screen, to provide opportunities for cognitive and social stimulation through exploration of ideas in history and culture. And what that looks like is, as I said, a simple conversation among folks. We look at the art, we look closely, we take our time and we see what it is that we all see on the screen, or on well, on the screen in the virtual or on the canvas in the gallery. And we make meaning from that. The, one of the goals is to reduce caregiver burden and isolation. So it's an opportunity to step away from your normal role as a caregiver and to spend some time sitting with your loved one just as the person that you know them as, not as caregiver and cared for. Um, part of the, the plan also is to honor the lived experience that people are bringing to us. So we know that everyone, regardless of what level of progression their illness has taken, has a, had a full life and has lots of experience. And so those kinds of experiences and um, their views on life tend to come out in the conversation, which is really lovely. And we want to meet people exactly where they are. So whatever that looks like, we're happy to have the conversation. And it provides access to our nation's museums, which for folks who may be getting in the car and traveling to the museum is an arduous process. We can take our time with folks at home. They don't have to go through all that. The barriers that come with transportation and parking and walking and all those things have been reduced by the process of being in the gallery or moving from the gallery to the virtual rather. Go ahead, Robin. Thank you, Amy. Um, and so a little more detail about our programs. We have three branches of the program uh, that have developed over time. We started out with what we call our public programs. So this is for anyone to join us virtually or in the gallery um, who has dementia uh, or is a care partner with someone with dementia. Um, the, all of our programs are free. All three branches of our programs are free, but this one we advertise publicly, um, folks, get in contact with us if they're interested and they just are um, able to come. It's really a low barrier to joining. Um, we do that twice a month, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, then we, those folks are mostly joining us from home. They're people who are aging in place um, and usually people will join with um, someone with dementia and either a professional caregiver or uh, someone they're living with, a parent, um, parent and child, family member, friend. Um, we have folks with dementia who are still joining us who do not have a live-in care partner. Um, and, we, and we sometimes have care partners who join without their um, loved one with dementia. We really want anyone in that, um, the realm of those two identities to be able to join. And then we um, started doing community programs a couple years ago. So this is where we work with specific organizations, uh, senior care facilities, villages, PG County Dementia Friendly, um, and any social groups where folks are gathering uh, who have dementia. And we cater specific programs to those people. So when we were in the gallery, that meant folks would come join us um, in the museums. And now we have transitioned virtual and are able to bring the program to where people are at. Um, so that means we'll sometimes have programs within um, 
an activity room at a care facility or just earlier today we did a program with um, Kingdom Care Village down in Anacostia and all those folks are a community together even though they are all still living at home. Um, and then the third program, which is our newest program, we're very excited about this, uh, launched in March of this year, Simi en Español. And so this is a program solely in Spanish. All of our educators are fluent in Spanish. They've all been trained um, in dementia-friendly programming, like all of our docents and educators um, have gone through an extensive uh, dementia-friendly training um, with uh, experts in the field of art and history and how um, those two things can be used to support folks uh, who have dementia and in the goals we mentioned. And as Amy touched on a little bit, the content of our programs, which you'll see a little bit later when we get to do one together, we always uh, investigate two to three artworks or historical objects. So if you've ever been on a um, docent tour in a museum, you probably were used to going to 10 to 15 places, zooming through the museum, or when you went by yourself, kind of seeing as many floors as you could. Um, and one of the crucial elements of our program is we're really slowing down. We are taking our time with um, two to three artworks. Often people before they've joined our program say, really, you can spill a whole hour with just two things? But our goal really is to get people talking and, and engaging with each other. And you'd be surprised how, um, how quickly that hour will will pass when, when we create space for uh, people to make meaning out of their own reaction to an art piece or historical object. Um, and in those, uh, in the program, you've probably heard us say a couple times already, meaning making, inquiry, close looking, those are the words we like to use in museum education and specifically um, with dementia friendly museum education. We are, we'll, when we first show an object, we'll sit for our up to a minute and just look um, quietly. You know, we want to create space for folks who um, who are are processing cognitively at a different speed, and any of us who just need to slow down a little bit, uh, get present with the work, and and really pay attention to what is coming up for us when we look at an object. And then we ask questions. So much of what our docents and educators are doing, they're not saying, now I'm gonna tell you about this, the facts of this piece or um, you know, historical meaning that, that uh, drones on for, for a long time. We really want to know what you think about the work. And then we'll fill in the educational pieces um, in ways that relate to what you're interested in, what our participants are interested in. And, and then through that, we get to share stories and connect with each other and, and find, um, we've had participants join us where, you know, it's a, a parent and their child and the parent will tell a story that the child never heard before because something was stimulated in that person through um, looking at the, that artwork or historical object. So we are currently hosted by five museums. So I'll read the list for you. The National Portrait Gallery, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the National Museum of Asian Art, which you may know of as the Freer, Freer Sackler Galleries, um, and the National Museum of American History. Um, we take time with each of those museums. We rotate through uh, a five uh, museum rotation every two and a half months, each one comes up. So if there's one that you have a preference for, you can select um, coming to those programs, or you can come to all, uh, all five consecutively and uh, experience each of those museums. The, and the objects that are selected are new every time. Um, we've been looking at things like, um, there's a, an object called the Mothership related to P-Funk at the uh, National Museum of African American History and Culture. When we last were visiting with our friends from the National Portrait Gallery, we looked at two images of Asian American artists who have had interesting lives and struggles. And so we learned a bit more about each of those individuals as well as the artists that created their portraits. Um, so those are the kinds of experiences that we have in museums. They may be a historical object. We looked at refrigeration and how it changed our lives at American History. Um, and the um, uh, an assortment of different lovely Asian screens and prints and things. We've taken advantage of the fact that we can look at things that are smaller. Many Asian pieces are very small, so we get to zoom in with our cameras and see them up close. So the variety is great. The subject matter, there's bound to be something for everyone. 
And in each program, we have 10 to 18 participants. What that looks like is um, in our public programming, we, we call it dyads. So it would be a person living with dementia and their care partner would be one dyad, or it may be an individual for those folks who are not yet uh, in need of a care partner. And so the, there's anywhere from five to five dyads to whatever 18 breaks up to is at nine. <laughs> so um, we spend time in a small group. We try not to have too many people because we recognize that the intimacy and close conversation we're looking for is hindered by a larger group. Um, so, so far we're averaging around 10 to 12 folks in any program. They're hosted on Zoom, or and you can do that through your computer and see the video, or you can also call in by phone. And we make it a point to offer something called verbal description when we know that someone is on the phone in particular. And part of that comes from the conversation that we have. As we're talking about the piece, we say, oh, well, we see this in the object, or we see that in the object. And our descriptions of what we personally see can give a view to the person on the phone in their mind's eye of what we're, we're looking at. So it's a, it really is pretty successful by phone if that's the easiest way for you to, to join the conversation. As we said, the program is free, but registration is required. Now registration means send an email and we have a conversation maybe on the phone if there's time to do that. It's not arduous. We want it to be as easy as possible. We also don't require a specific RSVP for each program. It's a uniform link that's used the same uh, same link every time. So if your day is free and you're able to join us, that's great. If you think you're going to come, but then you don't because something came up, that's okay too, because we recognize that happens. Life happens, and we don't want this to be yet another thing on your plate to stress over. So show up as, as you're able, and uh, when you can't, that's okay too. The email is access at si.edu. That will also be at the end of this PowerPoint, so you can have access to that again. Um, but that's the basics of our virtual program at this point. Yeah, and when they happen, so they are the first and third Wednesday of every month, the public program that we've been talking about where folks can join us from home. Um, that has been pretty consistent. Uh, when we were in gallery, that was when we did our programs. When uh, COVID happened, we paused for two months as we kind of figured out how to move virtual. But since May of last year, we've been doing virtual programs the first and third Wednesdays of every month as well. Um, and then Cine en Español is the fourth Wednesday of every month. We are uh, hoping to add a second uh, program in Spanish in this fall um, as, the, as we uh, develop that program. They always are from 2 to 3 p.m. Um, and these are the public and see me in Espanol programs. Now, as I mentioned, the community programs are scheduled upon special request because uh, we um, are really in that scenario. We're really working with one group. Um, and so we want to do what works best for whatever group that is. If it's a senior facility and they always do their programming at two in the afternoon on a Thursday, that's when we'll do it. Um, or uh, if we're working with a village and they like a little bit later, if people are still working, we can we can accommodate that. So um, those programs, we try to do those twice a month and we rotate through the different community partners we have. So as much as we want to be offering those to community partners uh, on a rotating basis of every month right now, we're probably, we're about offering um, them three to four times a year per community partner. And I wanted to add a couple other things that came up um, as Amy was talking. Um, we are planning to do hybrid programming once people are still able, once people are able to be in the museums again. So that's a big question folks have. Uh, it was just recently announced that some of the Smithsonian museums are going to be opening up again at a rolling basis over the next couple months. Um, but we know that many folks are still not going to feel comfortable coming into the museum. Um, and some people just really enjoy uh, joining from their home. It was it was really interesting when we moved virtual, we noticed that many of our participants were more verbal, were more relaxed, not having to travel down to the museum, um, find parking, uh, you know, and, and that was all the people who could even travel to the museum. We've, we've had folks um, 
in our Spanish program, we had someone uh, last program join from Peru and from Texas. So we are we are expanding out through our virtual programming regionally too. So that's important to us. Although we do really care about our local community um, accessing the museum. So there's still a focus for us on serving those in our area. But for you all in PG County, if, if it's a little too far to go, we still will be offering virtual programming and in-person programming as, as we're able. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we have talked about uh, folks engaging verbally and and although that is a wonderful thing and is important, we, we don't shy away from folks who are progressed enough where they're not verbal. Um, it really depends. We try to, to cater to people and when we work with some senior facilities, they know their community. Um, you know your family member or your loved one and if you think they would get something out of this, we want them there. Um, and then the third thing that came up that I wanted to make sure to mention is we have a wonderful partnership with Arts for the Aging, which is a uh, arts-based uh, organization nonprofit in DC who works specifically with older adults and they do every type of art imaginable performance music poetry uh, visual arts um, dance and we've always worked with them and especially going virtual we've tried to work with them more to make the 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 virtual Zoom computer-based programming even more engaging. So the program that we'll be doing with y'all um, in a couple weeks uh, will be with an opera singer. I don't want to give too much away about the program, but um, we're very excited to be able to partner with artists who, who engage um, a creative element um, in the programming too. And I also want to read um, this. Actually, Amy, could you read the participant quote? I can't see it on my mm -hmm. screen. Sure. This was an interesting and necessary experience where you're in a place focused doing something that has value. And that comes from directly from one of our participants. They uh, seem to really enjoy that, taking that moment of focus and escape. All right. Well, okay. then let's begin. Uh, we have the next screen, please. So the object that is in front of you is in the collection at the National Portrait Gallery. I would invite you to take just a few seconds, 30 seconds to a minute, and just observe the piece. You may want to take a little bit of a breath in and release it. Science tells us that we engage things more actively when we have an inhale of breath. So if we could do that together, just take a big breath in and then release it. We're going to do it one more time, but as we do it this time, I'd like you to just allow your eyes to focus in on one section of the object, whatever catches your view. So let's take that big breath in and release it. And wherever your eyes settle, just take your time and look closely. I'm going to be quiet and let you do that. So I'm curious to know if there was something that stuck out to everyone. Please feel free to use your raise hand option, and then we can hear what Michelle? folks have to say. Mm -hmm. uh, Michelle, go ahead. Her, her cheek bones, her cheeks. Um, okay. they, they almost look like she um, has blush on. So you're yeah. noticing the color of them? Yes. OK. All right, so we have someone who noticed some blushy cheeks. Nice. I like that. <laughs> Anyone else? Betty? Um, her hands and her necklace. Okay, so her hands mm. and her necklace. I'm curious to know what in particular stood out about those for you. Well, I like the shape of the necklace, and it looks like uh, you can almost see some of the detail of it. And her hands look like mm -hmm. she's tired and weary. Tired and weary. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. Is there something particular about them that makes you say tired and weary? Uh, the position of them. Okay. So mm -hmm. the way she's holding them, that, that straight vertical up and down of her hands. Yeah. Interesting. So if I knew that we had some folks on the phone, I might take this as a moment to say that this is a sculpture of a figure that you can see from about the knees up. The figure seated, mm -hmm. 
leaned forward with hands rested on their on her knees and her hands are kind of dangling vertically between her knees as they just hang straight down any other thoughts rhoda i noticed her hands too but i had a different perspective on her hands okay she looks like she's about to start some sort of task um i think the thing that caught my eye was the bun of her hair on her head on her head it reminded me of my grandmother um who was a farmer's wife and um that's how my grandma used to keep her her hair but also her mm -hmm. i agree with the other lady about her fingers and her hands because mm -hmm. to me it looks like she's a very very hard working woman um mm -hmm. not smiling her hair is pulled up her hands are down her hands look uh, they don't look so clean to me like they've been in the dirt that they've been maybe gardening they've been working hard providing for her family so okay. i guess one of her hair and her fingers and her hands mm -hmm. so we've had noticings of the the color of her cheeks the little bit of blush there the mm -hmm. position of her hands taking two different views one of uh, weariness and one also of hard work and a, the or the about to act kind of position of them. And then also we've had someone who's noticed the bun in her hair and made a really beautiful association with a grandmother and the way that she wore her hair, the farmer's wife. So mm -hmm. do we have any other thoughts? Yes, uh, we have a couple hands. Okay. Uh, Michelle, did you have something that you wanted to add? And then Loretta? Uh, yes, are, are you going to tell us the name of the sculpture? Oh. Sure, sure, <laughs> absolutely. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry. This is a sculpture of um, Gertrude Stein, the famous American author. Oh. Uh, now oh, we okay. have the, the information on it. Gertrude Stein, born the 3rd of February of 1874 and died 27 July 1946. And this was done by Joe Davidson, an artist um, that I was not familiar with before this. And in truth, I don't know a great deal about him, but but yes, Gertrude Stein, the author. Now, I don't know if she was a gardener, but I can imagine that she's not a real pretentious looking woman. She's not overdone mm -hmm. or super fancy. So perhaps she was someone who dressed in casual clothes and got out into her yard and, and dug around in the mm -hmm. dirt. I can kind of picture that. I, I totally can get where you're going with that. So there, was there another, was it Loretta, the other name that I heard? Yes, Loretta, and the last one is Betty Gidding. Go ahead, Loretta. Um, I really liked um, the jewelry around her neck because even though she does look tired and like she's been working hard, there still was the attempt to, you know, maybe have some, you know, something really feminine on and it's a lot of, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, spite of the fact that maybe she was gardening or working hard and her, the blouse seems to have like a little design, the collar kind of thing. That was cool too. So she did at least look like she made an effort to, um, you know, still have some character about she was doing, even mm -hmm. though she looked busy and really tired. So that stood out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that necklace too. It really adds something to the piece and the little flutter of the collar of her shirt or or uh, whatever that is. And one last person? Yeah, Betty getting. You have two Betty. <laughs> Go ahead. Bet oh, if you can unmute yourself. I basically have you... the same comment about her hands. I'm a gardener, so I always notice people's hands. <laughs> but um, she seems, as I said earlier, like she's about to start a task or that she's about to do something. Um, and I agree with the uh, Rhoda that it uh, looks like she's a hard worker because she uses her hands and you can tell, not that they look weather beaten or anything like that, but you can mm -hmm. tell by the position that, that she, Looks like she's about to take on a task or do perform some task. So I love that you all are are getting a sense of who she might be as an individual and her activities. Mm -hmm. And I'm one thing that really I find very intriguing um, is when I consider the formal qualities of this piece as a uh, sculpture. It's sort of triangular shaped. So we have the top of her bun mm. being the top of the triangle and then the sides of her knees being the corners. And that's a really stable form. And it's often used with figures like the Virgin Mary. She'll be 
in the center, larger than uh, the rest of the figures, and then there'll be smaller figures alongside her. That's a really common mm. device used in art and the way that compositions are made. And the stability of it can lead to being very stagnant. But I love the fact that you all have seen her hands and seen movement or the potential for movement. What is that, kinetic mm -hmm. energy or potential energy? I forget which it is in <laughs> physics, but, but you're picking up on that. And I think that's a really beautiful um, tribute to the, the skill of the artist that we're able to see more than just that stable shape. I think that's really beautiful. Um, Robin, can you go forward to the photograph, two shots or two, two slides? One slide. All right, so so this is an image, a photograph that was taken by Man Ray. Um, I don't know the time on it. I, I forgot to take note of that. But Man Ray was a photographer who is pretty prominent in um, art historical circles. You may have heard of him, you may not have. That's okay, regardless. Um, but it was potentially taken for an article in Vanity Fair magazine. And this is the moment when the artist is creating this piece. So. On the left-hand side of the photograph, you can see the image of the sculpture. In the center, we see the artist actively working at the piece. And on the right-hand side of the, the image, we can see the sitter. We can see Gertrude Stein sitting there in that position. Her knees are a little apart. Very unladylike for the early 1900s, I'm sure. But a lady's doing it, so let's call it ladylike, right? Um, so she's got her elbows her, on her knees. She's got her hands settled between her knees, as it is, it is in the sculpture, uh, on a raised platform. And we can see if I don't know how good the resolution is. This is an old photograph, and it was taken off of the internet. So forgive me for any lack of resolution, um, but you may be able to see the collar of her shirt and that necklace that you mm -hmm. see in the sculpture. So I thought this was a really interesting view of the process. I'm all about materials and process. That's part of my what, what gets me excited and gets me up in the morning. So um, do you guys have any thoughts as you're seeing this? How does this change the way you view the sculpture or does it? Hmm. I heard a hmm. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, Rhoda, go ahead. <laughs> I don't I really see anything different in the sculpture this time, but what I find interesting is that the sculptor has on a suit jacket. Got nice <laughs> and he's he's working on this piece in a looks like even a tie, maybe. A mm -hmm. tie white shirt mm -hmm. and a suit coat. Yes. It's a pretty yeah. interesting way of doing work, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I assume if anyone was going out into their garden or to do something, their hands might get dirty. They would certainly not be wearing their Sunday best, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think it's just a function of the time. At that time, mm -hmm. when a man left the house, he was in a suit, unless he was mm -hmm. a workman, which an artist is in this really tricky position between a workman mm -hmm. and an artisan or someone of an elevated status of like socioeconomically at the time and i think it's interesting because you know in the renaissance there were guilds and in the guilds there were artists and house painters were in the same guild and artists worked really hard for hundreds of years to separate themselves out from the workmen who were doing things like painting houses so, so a sculptor who worked in wood might be in the same guild as someone who would build houses and they just didn't see that as being the same thing and there's this historical battle between art and craft and I feel like now today we're kind of throwing some of that away all of that old baggage of the hierarchy but I feel like that may be a reason why this artist is dressed the way he is and an artist in general would wear whatever their day-to-day -day clothes were of the their status in their society and despite the challenges of working with paint or plaster or whatever this happens to be terracotta so i know you know that that gritty feeling that you feel on the side of a terracotta pot i'm, I'm imagining if we reached out and touched this piece that that might be how it feels as he's working it so dusty powdery orange stuff everywhere right um, so so yeah 
if he's representing his socioeconomic status and his role as an elevated artisan, that may be why he chooses to work in a suit. That's my wow. theory on it. Clever. Possibly. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. <laughs> Just my sense. So, um, the do does anyone have any other further thoughts or questions about this piece at this point? Uh, Fatima, have you have your right hand raised? If you can unmute yourself. Yes. To me, it's just seeing the lady in the back now brings the statue to life to me. I can link it with an actual person now instead of just looking at his artwork. I can, you know, make a correlation while wow, this was a real person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, isn't that just a beautiful thing? This was the last minute find this image and I'm so glad that it's in here because I, I think it's a really great addition. Seeing Gertrude Stein as a human being is a big part of what we're doing. Now, if we're looking at Gertrude Stein in our regular programming, let's get a little meta about this for a moment. Um, that would be run by our staff um, partners from the museum. Uh, we have the person who's in charge of accessibility in the museum. Her name is Vanessa and uh, she has a co-worker, Irina, who do the programs and they would know more about the individuals than I do. They would know more about the artists than I do. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm filling in and doing what they would do. Um, but uh, yeah, I feel like it would be nice to have a little better sense of Gertrude Stein as a person. And so what I would like to do um, because she's a famous author, I thought it would be interesting to hear some of her writings. Now, I don't know how familiar you are with cubist art. Think Picasso and the stuff that's like everything going every which way. Uh, and that's what her writing sounded like a lot of what I was reading. And I, I found it very difficult to understand because what cubists do is they draw or paint or sculpt a piece looking at it from different perspectives at the same time. So you might see the front of my forehead and the side of my nose and the back of my head all in one view from the front. And that's kind of what her writing was like. It, it was a little bit disjointed, I guess is the best word I could use for it. So what I'd like to read to you instead is a love poem that Gertrude Stein wrote. And uh, Gertrude Stein was involved with a woman named Alice, Alice B. Tokler, I believe is how you say her last name. Uh, she was also an author and they lived very openly. They were not, you know, afraid about their position and being in Paris in particular or in the south of France during World War II, being American, gay, modern artists and Ooh. women altogether was a very, very difficult thing to accomplish surviving World War II in France, mm. occupied by the Germans. But when, when Gertrude Stein was writing, she would write little love notes in the margins of her work. And then her partner would actually type up her, her work after she got done writing. She would type up her notes and things. So she would find these little notes. So let me read this note to you. Um, she says, do you really think I would? Yes, I would. And I do love all you with all me. Do you really think I could? Yes, I could. Yes, I would love all you with all me. Do you really think I should? Yes, I should love all you with all me. Yes, I should. Yes, I could. Yes, I would. Do you really think I do love you, love all you, with all me? Yes, I do love all you with all me and bless my baby. She called her, her partner her baby, precious baby. So mm. with, with that note <laughs> about the person of Gertrude Stein, I'm just going to give us a little minute to sit with that. <laughs> wow. So do we have any final thoughts before we move on to the next piece? 
Um, I see Betty's hand raised. I'm not sure. Um, did you want to respond to that or was your hand up earlier and I just missed it? I'm sorry, Betty. <laughs> that was a mistake. No problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if we're ready, then we can move on to the next slide. Ooh. So this is something completely different. So let me set the stage for you. We are walking up to this object in the gallery and the mannequins in front of the train are in fact life size. So as you walk up to this piece, imagine that you have to turn your head way up to see the top of that stack. That stack is about 10 feet up in the air. My husband's six feet tall and even he would have to look way up. So imagine how that feels to your body as you walk up to it and tell me what you would feel in your body walking up to something so large. I have to say that my first instinct is a bit of overwhelm. So as we're sitting here taking all this in, can you tell me a little bit of what you see? Uh, it looks like a family is together. Okay. That's what do you see that makes that you see? Stands out. Okay. What makes you say family? Um, it looks like they're all sort of hand in hand. <laughs> so the husband okay. and wife, it appears, and then the daughter is holding the mother's hand. Okay. So that just connectedness and closeness okay. sort of comes across as family. Nice. I can appreciate that. Oh, so, Betty, um, your hand is right. Betty, uh, getting. Yeah, it looks, I would be overwhelmed. I mean, I'd have the same response by something that large, but it looks like, um, I don't know, it, it doesn't seem like there's anyone else around besides them. So mm -hmm. uh, just a different kind of setting, I guess you would expect to see more people if it's, you know, a train platform that's mm -hmm. that busy. But um, yeah, I agree. It does look like a family. It's just that it looks like they're in a different area of the platform. And I'm not even sure. I guess this is a passenger train. It's just a piece of one car. So it looks like um, there, some of that that's there is cargo. That mm -hmm. they're gonna put on the train. Yeah, this train was called the Jupiter, and it was partially a passenger train and partially um, they carried agricultural goods, uh, light freight and passengers was the description that I read about it. So yeah, and the scene that we're seeing is somewhat artificial, uh, I'd say well, obviously art, entirely artificial. It is in the museum and um, one of our colleagues took the time to where all the blue is in the background to blot out all the things that are extra. So another little meta comment about how we run the program is um, that process was undertaken so that it would just uh, make it so folks could focus on the object itself without having to figure out what's background, what's foreground. And so if someone's having a little bit more trouble with, you know, those kinds of distinctions in their own lives, it makes it simpler so that they can just see what it is that we mean for them to look at without having to think so hard about what, what's what in the image. Um, so for someone who has some visual spatial kinds of concerns because of their illness, that eliminates one barrier to being able to really understand what we're talking about. Um, so to go back to the piece, it is an, a locomotive, so that's the engine of the train, and then there's a, a fuel car behind it, that red bit at the back. Um, if I was to describe this, I would say that it's a long, narrow cylinder at mm -hmm. the front of the train with black and gray and bands of brass, and then accents on the front. Yeah. Uh, and uh, up across the top of it with a tall stack that has a round uh, funnel like cone shaped uh, bit at the top. And then behind that cylinder is what would be the, the um, what's the name of the guy who runs the train? Conductor. Uh, yeah, thank conductor, you. Yeah. The conductor's cabin. Yeah, we all work on this together, right? Uh, and the conductor's cabin is made of wood. And then I have red. A question. Yes, please. 
Has anybody noticed that the the train has all the color and that the people are um Great. are grayed out? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're, they're almost uh, like ghosts. I mean, they're really <laughs> there's no color whatsoever. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, why do you think that the people at the museum might have chosen to do that? Just speculating. So you're saying that's not the the yeah, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. And that's a fair answer. Absolutely. Yeah. Who knows what's in the head of curators, right? <laughs> yeah. So this is a life-size train and they wanted to give it some context. So mm -hmm. they put the figures in front of it, but they didn't want the figures to be the focus. They wanted the train to be the focus because that's what's on exhibit. So by okay. making the figures gray, that helps them to recede. They give context without taking over the show. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. But you can't help but notice them. True enough. <laughs> True enough. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they. Maybe if that was really the intent, maybe you don't have so many people. Yeah, perhaps. Or they could be like. <laughs> like uh plexiglass and flat <laughs> just yeah. cutouts i don't know yeah, yeah. okay yeah. thank you hey no problem um rhoda you had you have your hand up yeah, um oh okay unmuted um yeah my only thing was the the wooden box i guess where the conductor would what do you say drive the train um i guess i thought the people were more aristocratic because all of the gentlemen, they all have hats. The, the, the wife, I guess, has a hat. And with her long skirt, I mean, they, they look stunning. And I had just thought maybe the family would ride with the conductor as he was driving this train down the track. That would be a real like VIP insider moment, right? Yeah. Exactly, yes. Yeah. yeah. The one thing I think that, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say that it's like they had the little box all to themselves, except for the conductor. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be interesting. I think the thing that would deter them from doing it is that big smokestack, uh, because there's coal being thrown in. I think it goes underneath where the the conductor's car or cabin is, and it mm -hmm. goes into the engine. And like that's fueled by either coal or by wood. And so I don't know if you've ever been in a house that has a coal stove or a wood stove and the ash and the soot and all that that comes off of it. I think that would really oh, yeah. mess up their pretty dresses. <laughs> so they may actually choose to pass on that one. I don't know. But it could be interesting to to get out there and be hanging on that bar on the side and get a little wind in your face. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so we do have another slide that shows a little bit about the inside of the train and the folks who were working to take care of everyone inside the train. Uh, so let's just mm. take a look at these for a moment. Tell me what you notice about them. Mm. They're all in white and black. Mm -hmm. That's true. A row of figures in black pants and white jackets with hats yes. on. Yes. Anything else jump out at you about them? They're all pretty much the same size. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're the same height. Maybe the uniform only came in one size. Yeah. <laughs> sort of like the Rockettes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Most of them are black. They're yes. pulling forward. Mm -hmm. That's oh, true. That's yeah. exactly who they are. Mm -hmm. oh, and yeah. who was it that said that they were Pullman porters? I did, Michelle. So Michelle, mm. do you know more about the Pullman porters? I'm I'm I curious mean, to know. I, I'm, I'm very limited, but I know that they were. That was a very um, prestigious position for African Americans mm -hmm. at the time. Oh. Um, uh, it, it. I mean, think about it. They got to travel. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how extensive, but um, and no, a very limited amount. But I just know that. Um, think about it. You had to have a certain command of the language. Um, mm -hmm. There were certain things that you had to be able to do. Um, certain temperament. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. no, but I have a limited knowledge of the Pullman Porters. Well, that's more than I had before earlier today. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had a conversation earlier today with our friends at uh, Kingdom, is it Kingdom Care Village, Robin? Yep. Okay. 
just want to make sure I got the name right. Um, and we had a, a pretty interesting discussion about the Pullman Porters. Now, the the image that is on the left is a, an illustration of the role that a uh, one of the roles that a Pullman porter would have fulfilled on the train. The, um, if you can see the green parts on the bottom, those are the seats on the train. And then the berths that created the sleeping cars come down from up above. And they have uh, a key that I didn't include in this PowerPoint, um, but it was part of our discussion. It's like a brass thing that fits inside your hand with a bit that sticks out and then it turns a little goes in a hole and turns like an actual key and the berth drops down so that they can for, uh, make the beds and there's an extra mattress on top that gets lowered down to make a second berth on the bottom it's like bunk beds Very cool and so the pullman porters were were taking care of the passengers on the train and their job was to make their travel as comfortable as possible and a big part of that was these sleeping cars um it was a total lap of luxury kind of thing as far as i can tell i, I rode in a sleeping car once going from Pittsburgh to Chicago and it was wonderful because I went to bed in Pittsburgh and I woke up in Chicago the next morning <laughs> it was like it was as if I didn't even travel um, so that was definitely like an amazing wonderful experience for me and for folks at this time when trains were relatively new um, this train in particular that it was completed in 1876 the transcontinental railroad had been completed in 1869 so um, the timing of it is just post-civil war just when trains were really taking over in the u.s and the whole train thing was just this big experiential thing um, it became a part of american society at that time and the Pullman porters, many of them were coming out of an experience as an enslaved person and were finally able to do um, meaningful work that was for their own benefit. And it meant that they were able to travel, as you said, Michelle, they were able to get around the country, they were able to access information from other places. We, they didn't have telephones much, like, well, at the time I think there was just telegraph, not telephones yet. So transferring information was really slow. And this was something that came up in the conversation earlier today among our friends at Kingdom Care Village. So it was a part of a regular conversation in this program, um, not something that we're having just now because you all are the care or caregivers or care partners. So, so keep that in mind that these are, this is the normal kinds of conversational elements that we experience. Um, and and I wanted to add too um, that they, the Pullman Porters created the first all black union um, in 1925 because they were excluded from um, the white Pullman Porters unions. And so that was another really important thing that they did. Um, they were treated horribly um, and overworked, worked 20 hour days. Um, mm -hmm. But through their organizing and their um, their labor work, they created yeah the first all black union, which was called the Brotherhood of the Sleeping Car Porters in 1925. Wow. Yeah, lots of great information That's about them too, and more um, American history too. If you want to learn more, um, um, okay. so. If you wanted to organize a group of folks, uh, you would just reach out directly to me. Um, my email is listed at the top. It's my last name, Marquis, M-A-R-Q-U-I-S-R, -S at si.edu. Um, you can always email our main access at si.edu um, email address. That'll get, to, that'll get to any of us as well. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, we'd please reach out. Uh, the first and third Wednesdays, that's, those are our programs in English. Uh, but if you are a community group that wants to work with us, um, then we, those are probably, like I said, three, to, three times a year, roughly. Uh, but we have two different ways that we can work with you. And sometimes the program would include art making. Sometimes it could include music. When we looked at the trains today earlier, we had a teaching artist with us who was, uh, he's a guitar player uh, for many, many years, and he played some trains train songs there's an amazing amount of music out there that's related to trains because of that american experience and um, so he shared those with us and there were songs that the the group knew and so we kind of had an old-fashioned sing-along everyone had their mics my mics muted so then it didn't get too loud but uh, we all followed along in our own rooms and uh, if we 
you know, the picture that you see on the screen right now, um, that was a singing type of an experience that we had in the gallery. The gentleman that's holding the woman's hand there, um, he's an opera singer. And so we had a, a contralto and then he was the tenor that was singing with her. So there may be some kind of other part to the experience, but the, the heart of it is looking at museum objects. We do take our time with explanations. If there's something coming up that's going to be different from what we've been doing, we try to be very intentional and thoughtful about the language that we use to explain things. Um, and another part of this is that the program is as much for the care partners as it is for the person living with dementia. So if it's something that it's nice just to sit down and relax with your mother for a while, and she's engaged and having an experience, whether she's uh, has a lot of verbal input or not isn't really that uh, that important but if it's something that brings her pleasure or um, brings her connection with you then then it's achieved its goal and we can view it we do view it as um, an element of respite in the the greater scheme of folks lives so you know respite doesn't have to be a weekend away it doesn't have to be waiting for your vacation it can be just taking an hour to set down your caregiver role just for a little while and, and enjoy time with your mother so for our community programs we have a mailing list and um, if you were to register for the program we would put your name and email on the waiting list and then what we would do is the Monday before the program happens, all the programs happen on a Wednesday. So the Monday before that, I would send out an email that has the link in it. It is a repeating link, but you'll get it fresh every Monday before the program. And then that will be a little bit of information in that that tells you which museum is hosting the program and a little bit about what the content is so you can decide if it's something you're interested in or not and then um, you make the choice on Wednesday to click the link it's as simple as that there on the screen you can see the emails that uh, the email addresses for each of us mine is castine at a or castine a at si.edu that's my last name first initial and the rest I really appreciate you all being so in, interactive and this is our first time. Usually we, we see everybody on the Zoom screen and, and we love to be able to feed off of each other's, um, you know, reactions and stuff. So, so you all were, were so uh, involved and gracious with us not being able to see each other. But that is one of, one of the parts that will be different with the program is, is getting to see each other's faces. I want to thank Robin and thank Amy for presenting tonight. This was really great information. Um, I would like to thank the participants for being so engaging and um, because you all helped to make the program what it is uh, when we have our webinars every Thursday night. So thank you all as well for being here tonight.